Artificial intelligence. Whether you are the kind of person that would swear off any use of AI or someone that has strived to integrate it into every facet of their life, I'm sure the one thing that we could agree on is it has permeated through society with no indication of slowing down anytime soon. It is changing the way we work, make decisions, and engage with the world around us. On the consumer side, you're likely encountering AI more often than you think. It may be used in ways that are completely transparent to you, such as accelerating a diagnosis in a hospital for machine learning. And of course, every tech company is racing to integrate AI into their products and services and get it into your hands. Whether that be Adobe with generative functionality in Photoshop, Google with Gemini, Apple with Apple Intelligence, and the list goes on. When you're not distracted by that face swap or generative filled photo in your timeline, you might be at a job that has adopted some form of AI as well. A global survey last year by McKinsey and Company of almost 1,400 organizations reported that 65% of those organizations were using AI or generative AI, a near doubling over 2023. Organizations are racing to adopt AI and everyone is grappling with the same question of how they can leverage AI in a meaningful manner. To put it in another way, a business may be using AI to increase the likelihood of you buying their product or service, and you may be using AI to figure out if their product or a competitor's are worth buying instead. Of course, it isn't all sunshine and rainbows. There are privacy and societal implications that are yet to be fully grasped or tackled. We shouldn't just hand wave those away, especially when many of those AI tools involve uploading sensitive content to a data center that may be on the other side of the world. And large language models by their very nature are going to be trained on a wealth of information. We are already trying to grapple what it means for artists, musicians, photographers, and writers. We are trying to control for bias and set up guardrails. Your content may be trained on or at risk of being trained on. This is not even getting into the implications when all your conversations with an AI that you may have thought to be private are leaked or discovered. While writing this script, reporting broke that a database from the company DeepSeek was discovered out in the open, without authentication, with over a million instances of chat history backend data, and sensitive data. If it wasn't for the fact that it was discovered by ethical security researchers, the consequences for users could have been much worse. Uploading content to the cloud should not be looked at at an abstract. You are putting the safety of your data in the hands of an entity you have no control over. This isn't new with AI, of course, but it bears repeating as these models and companies behind them try to get as much real user data as possible. These tools are amazing. They can be transformative. We just need to be more conscientious in how we leverage them. I've been trying or actively leveraging various AI tools on a day-to-day -day basis for some time now, such as Google's Gemini and Notebook LM products, GitHub Copilot for programming, Olama on my PC, and more. The three aspects of my use of AI tooling that I continue to contend with are one, data privacy. Where is my data being sent? How is it being stored or processed? Is it being trained on? Two, am I locking myself into a specific ecosystem by using specific tools? If I put all my eggs in the Gemini basket, would I be putting my or its capabilities at a disadvantage if I were to switch to iOS? And the same would go for using Apple Intelligence and then being locked into the Apple ecosystem if I wanted to keep the same AI experience. And three, am I holding myself back by using these more focused experiences and not something more extensible? What if a new model comes along that crushes one on my devices? Or suddenly the company developing the AI rips out a feature that I rely on? So. I have been actively searching for a solution that could even stand a chance of solving those three aspects. 
a local first, privacy first solution that could be cross platform and extensible, which doesn't require a mountain of work or expensive hardware to run. As cool as it would be, I'm not sure I would get the wife's approval for running a server rack in the living room, and that's not exactly something I could lug around with me. The solution wouldn't have to be perfect. It just needs the potential to be better. And if that means getting my elbows a bit greasy to make it happen, that is a sufficient compromise to me. So I was waiting a while because, well, there really wasn't anything. I was basically asking for someone to come along and commit to building a sane out of the box experience that somehow wasn't going to be artificially limited, not locked to a given operating system, with a commitment to have an open ecosystem for developers like myself. You know, going back to the days of actually owning your device in an era where it feels like I'm just renting every experience that I have. And it feels like I'm asking for the impossible. What I didn't expect was the company behind a mobile phone, an independent operating system called Selfish West, that I had used 11 years ago, would be the ones to deliver on it. But here it is. This is the Yola Mine 2, a privacy first AI computer. It is co developed between Yola and Venho AI. Yola are the designers of the hardware and provide Selfish OS as the underlying operating system. And Venho AI provides the AI platform that runs on top of it. When I was reintroduced to Yola last year, all those years later, with their announced new mobile phone called the Ola C2. I had also learned that they had been working on this as well, and it immediately piqued my interest. Despite a few short delays, it is finally here. Now, as a full disclosure, they did end up providing this to me a few days early, so I could review it, and I will be keeping it. But they have absolutely no editorial control, and they're seeing this at the same time as you are. This is just a product I'm genuinely interested in using, as well as developing and making content for. In fact, I had actually pre-ordered the device and was going to make a video about it anyways, so uh, me getting it early, well, thanks guys, it works out for me. Uh, but that's enough blabbering, let's actually unbox this thing. Um, I'm pretty excited. I didn't buy a box, but it is certainly a nice one. It follows the same design as the one for the Yola C2, with a style that goes all the way back to the original Yola one. As we open it, we find a nice card on top describing the port layout. The touch of the secured and sealed by Yola in Salo Finland sticker that is both on the exterior and the interior of the box. The device is really small, measuring 10 centimeters by 15 and a half centimeters and just a little under four centimeters tall. Here is the Yola C2 for scale. It has RGB lights that wrap around the device. I have been told that while they can't be turned off at the moment, it is something that will be configurable in the future, which is good because I'd like to keep the Mind 2 on without lighting on my living room when watching a movie. If we take a look at the port configuration, you'll find there is two USB type A, one being USB 2 and the other being USB 3. We have our USB data port for display or connecting to a dock. We actually have a SIM and micro SD slot here, though the SIM card one is just a placeholder for now with no modem inside. Alongside that, it has USB-C power delivery 3.0 for powering the device, which it expects to be 65 watts. It has gigabit ethernet and next to it power and reset. What you wouldn't otherwise notice is this surface is in fact a sensor. While it doesn't have a use yet, the idea is you could eventually use it to trigger actions such as starting audio recording and transcription, or presumably other configurable actions. Let's talk about some device internals. The pre-order community edition comes with the pre-installed 1TB NVMe SSD, which is certainly enough for everything I plan on using with it. If you order it now, it'll come with 128 gig eMMC storage module, plenty for documents and notes, but you may want to expand it later. The processor in the Mind 2 is a Rockchip RK3588, 
which is an eight core low power arm based processor capable of six top switches trillions of operations per second alongside the 16 gigs of memory smaller models should run well on the device especially when venho's special sauce of indexing local content is leveraged you're not going to be running the same insanely large models that you'll find in data centers but as we get smaller and more capable models as time goes on, the device is only going to get more capable as well. It is equipped with the second NVMe M.2 slot and 40 pin GPIO, so some good room for expansion assuming the device connected over GPIO actually fits in the case. There's already been talks in the Mind2 Discord about leveraging those for 4G and 5G modems and separate accelerators, which I think is pretty cool. The Yola Mind 2 runs Selfish OS with Venho AI and related software running isolated in containers. The Venho AI software is really in its infancy and more akin to an alpha, but that is actually what excites me the most and with a community that could help build and provide feedback on its development so early on, it has the potential to shape up to be a really solid user experience. With the unboxing out of the way, let's fire up the device and talk software. There's a short Selfish OS setup. It'll look much nicer in person, I've just had to chop mine up to avoid my camera's focus changes. In theory, it should detect Ethernet out of the box, but it didn't for me. So I set up Wi-Fi separately, and after going into the settings app of Selfish and turning on Ethernet, it just worked. At the moment, it is accessible solely from a web browser, with mobile experiences coming in the future. But fortunately, mobile phones do have browsers, so it's not really a big deal to me. While I won't be using the browser that comes out of the box to interact with it, I thought I would quickly show that it does have a native interface provided by Selfish OS, with the IP address conveniently shown if you need to connect to it from another device. Let's swap over to the browser experience on my desktop. I'm using Firefox, but it should work fine in any modern web browser. I went through a short sign up flow to create a zippy decentralized ID. At least based off the Zippy documentation, it uses blockchain technology to eliminate its centralized authority and enhance privacy. We'll have to dig into that a bit later in a different video. After logging in, we're met with a clean dashboard featuring the messaging center and document center. I was informed that fixes and improvements to those should be in a forthcoming OTA. So in lieu of those, I'm going to stick with just testing out the conversational UI. This shouldn't really be an issue for customers that get after that first OTA, but if everyone else was at the starting line, I'd already be racing down the track. So the software I'm testing is really hot off the press. For those born this century, that means the software is fresh. I'll make another video once the OTA is out. So I'm going to break the ice with a simple hello. I'm sure my complete abundance of small talk here will really stun it. It replied with a simple hello back. Perfect, that's enough conversation for today. Thanks. Kidding, let's ask it what the capital of Finland is. It got that right, so at least it isn't trained on information from before April 1812, or thinking about Vasa, which was the capital of White Finland during the Finnish Civil War. Does it know what operating system Yola develops? Phew, it does. Would have been pretty awkward if it got that one wrong. Now let's hit it with a bit more of a complex question, describing the benefits of Rust over C++. I know I escalated that one quickly. I'm sure you're going down in the comments now to furiously type your love for C++, but let's let it cook. I'd like to mention that this is all running without the MPU accelerator in use currently, which I think you'll agree still results in some pretty good performance. So it'd only get better from here once that MPU accelerator is used. If I were to have all this in a document to explain the benefits, and it had processed it in the background, we'd be able to leverage its memory and it'd certainly be even faster. Right now it's acting like a student making up their five slide presentation on the fly rather than the overachiever with all their notes. Imagine how it'll act when that vector database is used and better models are released in the future. This is such an exciting time in tech, and I'm thrilled to finally have something that might fulfill those three aspects I mentioned earlier in my video, related to data privacy, not compromising my AI experience just because of my device choice, and 
extensibility to make my personal AI actually personal, it's going to be really interesting to see how the mind to and the software evolves over time. I know what I showed off today is a pretty short first look with just the chat, but if you're interested in following along in its development, as they add more features and functionality and as I explore more of them, be sure to subscribe because I'll be making more. And if you're interested with recent fixes to Selfish OS, I will actually be able to start daily driving the Yola C2. So keep an eye out for a video on how an independent mobile operating system shapes up in 2025. But thanks for watching and catch you guys next time.